Thank you, Dana. All right, we're back on. Uh, that was beautiful, thanks. That sort of gets us into a musical mood. Um, and I did actually forget one little announcement that I want to make before I start here, and that is that the cups and plates are compostable, and the WSU WasteWise uh, has set up composting bins over there. So uh, that's a good thing, so we can minimize the outfall for this. Well, okay, uh, Ken is in the room, Ken Malcolm is here, and he'll be, uh, uh, we'll be uh, sharing 45 minutes here, so I'm going to go through just a few uh, updates on things for you, and then Ken has a few more, and he'll have to plug in his laptop probably, so I can do some Q&A at the end of mine before Ken starts. So anyway, since last year, uh, we have a new addition to what we do, and that is the Langley Whale Center. This was our Christmas decorations. Uh, the outdoor part of that, including the uh, life-size orca in lights, uh, and the whale come, and a whole lot more were set up by Dave Anderson over there, board member. No, there he is. Um, And the interior, oops, well, the interior decorations were done by our new operations manager, volunteer coordinator, merchandise inventorier, uh, Wendy Signs Berta. You'll see here, that's Wendy with her sister uh, holding up the, uh, the Chuchokum uh, stand. Uh, and uh, she's a, a great addition to what we do and uh, takes a, a, a big load off us in terms of keeping track of uh, the Whale Center. Um, and <laughs> Wendy also couldn't be here today for the same reason. Uh, so we also have this new sightings map which is a really incredible achievement. Uh, a volunteer, Thorsten Lisker from Germany, uh, spent many, many, many hours uh, compiling viewpoints all the way from Deception Pass down to uh, Bud Inlet, Olympia, all the way down, everywhere that is a good public location for people to go and see whales. There's about 120 different locations on a Google map, so you can zoom right in, you can highlight every location, and every one has uh, a description and a map or uh, an overhead view of every one of those. So it makes it very easy to find out where to go to see whales. When you hear they're coming down Admiralty Inlet, they're headed around Point No Point, you can go to that map on Google, and of course it's linked from our page our Facebook and our website. So you can go right there and you can zoom right in and find the best place and that will enhance shoreside viewing of uh, the whales going by. And I also want to introduce you to Alisa Lemire Brooks, who is uh, coordinating our sightings network, our new staffer here. We're so proud to have her on board. Uh, and she is a veteran. It's not like she's got to learn anything new to do this because she's been doing it anyway for years and years. Uh, has been out there seeing the whales and telling people about them. So she'll be keeping up our Facebook page. Uh, she gets up earlier than we do, so that really helps when the whales come by. Uh, and uh, this is her impersonating a jellyfish at the Welcome the Whales parade in Langley a couple of years ago. Um, so, wait. And this has probably uh, become a very active and interactive way to keep track of where the whales are, and that is to just go to our Facebook page, and uh, you'll probably see recent reports, and of course if you have any reports, you can post them right there, uh, and that way you get a sort of a running track of of where the whales are going. 
it's really fascinating when they head down, say, Admiralty Inlet, uh, people are at Point No Point, they're at Edmonds, they're at Kingston, they're at, you know, every little point, and of course they're all on that sightings map you saw. Uh, and so you get a sort of a minute by minute, and sometimes some great photos and behavioral descriptions, and what that really sort of ends up doing is it attracts a whole bunch of people to a, to a place where they can, you know, all be there and looking at the whales and getting to know each other. Something about whales gets people wanting to share, wanting to tell each other, wanting to sort of, you know, express their enthusiasm. And so this whole community of people who are enthusiastic about whales because they, they, they know that they're there, they have access, they can actually see them, and they tell their friends and relatives and co-workers, and uh, it's just expanding exponentially. So. It's a great way to sort of build a community of people who are aware, hyper aware, on a daily basis, refreshing their, their knowledge of the whales that actually live here, that we share these spaces with. And that's, that's vital for, for wanting to help them, for caring about them. So it's a, it's a really thriving network of people that are involved in the whales. So now, as promised, I want to give you an update on the Lolita situation. Uh, for anyone who isn't familiar, and I doubt there is anyone, but in case, um, she is an L pod whale captured in 1970, a couple of miles from here, over in Penn Cove, uh, and delivered to Miami. And she's been there ever since, right there. In fact, that's an expansion from where she was at first in 1970. It wasn't until the mid-80s that they decided, oh, they should put a little pool in the back and expand it a little bit. It's 20 feet deep by 80 feet by 35 feet to the work area, and then a medical pool in the back. So not a lot of space there. So there's been a campaign. We've been uh, generating support, actually, Ken and the Governor and Secretary of State started the campaign in 1995 and it, uh, you know, it's been kind of uh, steady, you know, a little here, a little there, but not much going on until the last couple of years. And things have really taken off. They've got some professional help now. They've got lawyers. <laughs> uh, and so that's making a big difference. This is how she spends her nights in between shows. Uh, she's just got really nowhere to go and no one to go with. So that's where she's been all this time. And yet she can still do this. This was taken by Jill Hine just a couple of days ago in Miami. Uh, we went down to Miami for uh, the Miracle March for Lolita. I'll show you a little bit of that in a minute too. Um, and uh, so she got that. So how does she do this? It's 44 and a half years now and counting, and yet she's still got that kind of energy. So she is in good shape, amazingly. Her teeth are good, we can't all say that. Uh, and she can still completely leap out of the water, and yet that tank is not as deep as she is long. She's over 20 feet, and it's only 20 feet deep, so I don't know how she does it. But it makes her a prime candidate, a perfect candidate for return to her native waters. So uh, we're working on it. And our, her lawyers noticed that uh, in the listing language in 2005 for the Southern residents, this little clause got included that means her, basically does not include captives. So they challenged that. Uh, beginning in 2011, in November, uh, to say, well, you know, take that out so that she can be considered a member of her family. I'm sure she does, so we should consider her a member of an endangered population uh, and get protections under the ESA. So uh, that started then, and it generated some publicity. This is Shelby Proy, who filled in in Miami for three or four years, uh, just generating protests and support uh, for Lolita. And she's holding up a Seattle Times front page article uh, saying, you know, maybe uh, Lolita can come home someday. So then it wasn't until April of 2013 
uh, that uh, Noah agreed, okay, we'll seriously consider that. That's a worthy petition. Uh, and then it wasn't until a year ago today that Noah said, okay, we agree in principle. Uh, this has complete merit. There's no reason to, to not include her, but it's going to take another year of comments and deliberations before it becomes a final ruling. That should be over today. We were hoping to get that ruling yesterday on a Friday afternoon when no one's looking uh, <laughs> and be able to tell it to you today. And that didn't happen. They can miss their own deadlines apparently. So Monday or Tuesday, we fully expect uh, that uh, she will be actually included as a member of her family under the ESA. Yay. Yeah, that'll be uh, on a way forward, uh, but exactly what it means remains to be determined. That's the problem, is that it depends on the definition of take and harassment. It is illegal to take in the language of the ESA, uh, which is any kind of harm or harassment uh, of a protected animal. Uh, but they could consider that returning her here would be harassment. Uh, they've said that that's, you know, that's one, one possibility, uh, or staying there. But because of this lawsuit against the USDA for licensing that tank despite at least three violations of the Animal Welfare Act, uh, the tank is too small, she is not protected from the midday Miami sun, and she's solo, she's alone. There are some white-sided dolphins in there with her, but they don't really get along, and so I don't think they qualify as companions. They say they do, but uh, anyway, there are violations, and if the violations are upheld, and that case was dismissed last August and will come up uh, for another court hearing on the appeal the week of March 23rd this year. So if that wins, it will establish that she is being harmed by the violations of the Animal Welfare Act. Then NOAA, to live up to what they say, that uh, this constitutes harm or harassment, has to remedy that situation and get her out of there. Uh, so that's coming up. And even if it doesn't win the appeal, it's documented in so many you know, legalistic ways that there is harm to her staying there. So uh, these lawyers have got some good strategies. <laughs> and on top of that is the OSHA fine. You may recall uh, uh, that SeaWorld was uh, cited and fined by OSHA. They appealed, that led to a big hearing. A whole lot of revelations, discovery came out of that and uh, some media that uh, they probably regret including a movie, you might have heard that. Um, and so that is coming up too in August of this year and OSHA has hired as their expert witness to inspect the Seaquarium, go through all the documents that have already been revealed, been delivered, uh, that go back 35 years of everything, you know, from veterinary records, I don't know what all it is, but study all that, and that expert witness is John Hargrove, who you might remember is in the movie Blackfish, uh, and has a book coming out, by the way, in March, called Beneath the Surface, and that is going to give you an inside look into SeaWorld essentially as a cult, as a sort of a life within a bubble with a corporate philosophy and culture um, that is oppressive to not just the whales, but to the trainers as well. Uh, he lived through being a complete enthusiast to uh, just getting out of there, and now he's revealing everything about it. So that book is coming out in March. It's gonna be incredible. Um, so anyway, uh, there's many more hits to come. Um, this was the Miracle March. In tandem with all of these legal efforts is this huge upwelling of popular support. This 
is about a tenth. That's my estimate. I don't know. I haven't seen any overhead shots to show the extent of it, but this was the thickness of the crowd. It then went across the front of the Sequarium and down the road about a quarter mile, looking like that. Nobody gave me a good count, but I estimate about 1,500 people, um, an all-day, you know, presentations, talks, and uh, great stuff, and a lot of media came out of it, NBC Nightly News, the Today Show, so it really upped the level. It's a national issue, uh, and uh, people have to think about it now which is pretty fantastic. And it really all kind of uh, points to her retirement plan, the proposal to return Lolita to a location in the San Juan Islands uh, for very gradual rehabilitation and uh, reintegration with her native waters where she was born and raised. Uh, we don't know exactly the age when she was caught, but around four, give or take a year. So they're very precocious at a very young age, and she was no doubt catching and sharing her own fish, communicating. She knew the ways of her family. I don't think that goes away, especially when your brain is four times the size of our brain. I think she retains that knowledge, and she'll be able to, to redo it. Um, this is an overhead, a Google view of the location. Um, and this is a, a surface view of it. Uh, so you can see it's a beautiful, pristine, very protected, very calm uh, cove within a bay. Uh, and over on a table there, we have this uh, easy thumbnail sketch of how to release Lolita in 11 easy steps, basically. <laughs> so, Please pick that up, uh, take a look at it, and uh, share it with your friends, because really the hard part for most people, especially the people in Miami, is to just get comfortable with the idea that it can be done, that it won't harm her, it, it'll, actually, it'll enhance her life greatly, it'll, it'll thrill her, her metabolic and cardiovascular parameters will improve her dive times, her curiosity, um, Keiko is, is the, the model for that. When he went to Iceland, his first immersion in his native waters, and that's after, I think, 12 hours of flight from Oregon to Iceland, and he's bigger, was bigger than she is. He loved it, he thrived. Uh, there's no reason to think she would not in this location. And there's also another aspect to this, that the whole Lolita proposal is going to intertwine with the issue that we're going to be talking about in just a minute, and that is the lack of sufficient Chinook salmon out there year-round to support the southern residents. Uh, it happens that this location is, without revealing the exact location or the ownership, the site of a Chinook salmon hatchery. Uh, that is an experiment that has been going on since the mid-80s that is very successful, uh, where there were no Chinook, just a natural spring, just by digging a few ponds and building a hatchery to be able to, to nurture the, the eggs uh, and then grow them in the ponds and then let them swim out to the sea. And they've been getting about 1,500 full-size, 20 to 30 pound Chinook per year coming back, which is small scale compared to the entire Pacific Ocean, of course, but it's a model. It's an experiment that is working and it is, you can replicate that. You can do that any natural source of water uh, from California to Alaska, really, and grow Chinook where there were none. The problem with hatcheries is that they compete with the native fish, uh, or they eat the native fish, or they genetically hybridize with the native fish, all of which can weaken the wild stock. So while you're growing industrial quantities of fish at a hatchery, you can decimate the wild runs, and that destabilizes the population. So 
This avoids that by growing Chinook where there were none before. So it's a great experiment. So along that line, uh, there is a huge effort up and running. What we have here is a, a small sort of fold-out brochure that is not yet hot off the press. This just was completed as, as a draft. It hasn't been printed yet, but it will be. And you'll be seeing them all over the place. And we encourage you when, you're, when you find them at events like this and are on San Juan Island uh, to, to take them, give them to people, uh, learn from them because this is basically the case for doing whatever it takes to provide more Chinook for the southern residents year-round out there. That is the pressing need. Their survival depends on it. And this brochure was made by uh, Cindy Hansen and Jill and Colleen uh, at the Whale Museum in collaboration with a whole lot of others uh, and so there's this thriving sort of core unit of people working on how we're going to bring back more Chinook for the southern residents and a big part of that is this even though obviously the Chinook are decimated up and down the coast by a thousand different uh, insults to their habitat and, and over harvest and all the other causes of their reduction in Chinook. A really big portion of that is the Upper Snake River, the Snake River and the Upper Snake. And there are four dams that are blocking passage. There are various, you know, fish ladders and barges and heroic and extremely expensive methods of trying to get the smolts downstream and the adult fish upstream to spawn and a small fraction of their historical numbers before the dams went in are still able to do that but there's 140 miles of main stem snake river that are inundated by reservoirs right now chinook salmon spawn in those main stem gravel beds that are now inaccessible to them and there's 5500 miles of tributaries above that that Chinook can spawn in, at least most of, uh, if they have free and open access to it. And the, the four dams below that on the Columbia River are certainly an obstacle, but they're certainly essential to the economy, to all sorts of other needs. And the fish can get around those. There's enough in the way of fish ladders and other means, especially with a court-ordered spill uh, during the out-migration of the smolts so that they can get downstream. That's proven uh, extremely successful. Uh, so it's just those four Snake River dams. Uh, and it's controversial. Uh, it's pushing against the tide in a lot of ways, but it needs to be done to keep the southern residents around. Okay, so I'm going to invite uh, Ken Balcom up here to bring his uh, uh, equipment.